All right. So, um, brief starting the session with a brief overview over the um, presentation sessions. So now that group allocations are hopefully sorted, um, what's the idea about the presentation session? Well, it is that you know you split or structure the entire um, session that you need to kind of um, you know plan for into two, right? So you have one general overview chunk that focuses on the area of interest that you have committed to, let's say cognitive ability, training games, uh, psychological effects, you name it. And a second one, which is more specific towards one specific paper. But talking about the first one, it's really about seeding the motivation more generally um, than identifying uh, associated um, uh, theories and papers um, in the field, right? So you start from, you know, why is cognitive ability or fostering cognitive ability important, you know, and then you provide an overview of the papers that are uh, ex existing in this uh, particular area and more focus on serious games. Serious games, they're being a means to an end. You know, there always it's a purpose associated with serious games. That's why we talk about motivational theories, right? What are they supposed to do? They afford either motivation in the first place um, or a behavioral change. And then you identify which, uh, uh, how do the, you know, different uh, papers um, apply different theories and what theories they make reference to. And we'll find a general pattern that different fields have a prominent use of particular theories. So that's the kind of pattern we want to get out of this and bring it together in the end synthesis. That's the point about identifying a meta structure in all the papers you reviewed in this field to kind of, you know, structure the field de facto. This is the kind of a takeaway um, uh, insight that everyone of us should actually uh, get based on your sessions. And then, uh, of course, you know, you uh, complement this intermittently or at the end, it's up to you with examples, right? You provide examples of uh, different games, both using different media forms, such as videos, uh, you know, pictures, of course, uh, but also possibly papers, screenshots, you name it. Um, feel free to use interactive media in this context. But it's important to kind of, you know, when talking about those examples, to bring it back to some extent to the theories and the uh, concerns relevant for the uh, subject and the domain, of course. So that's part one. Um, so distribute this wisely, usually uh, two to three or sometimes more me uh, members. So it should be quite straightforward doing this, 45 minutes. But if you plan this out nicely, then we also have time for a break afterwards. Um, and after the break, it's about discussing a specific paper. So part of your task here when you do this planning is to actually also identify a paper that you specifically want the class to read and discuss. And how it's done is basically you get in touch with uh, um, um, us, so Runo and myself, in, in order to kind of get an okay for a given paper. Um, or we nudge you in a different direction if we feel that's a too niche or too specific. You know, we want to have a coverage that's sufficiently representative of the field, but nevertheless only one paper. And um, that paper uh, is something you want to present, you know, providing the, the, the um, uh, main purpose of the paper, what is the method used, what are the analytical objectives, research questions, and so on. So you need to read the paper critically, effectively, but also the results, right? So you can uh, also um, identify, in as far as relevant for this course, the theories that are employed uh, in there, the gamification feature that you find, and so on. So all of uh, those different things. Um, in as far as relevant. And uh, of course, it always boils down in the end to kind of pros and cons, you know, what is good about the paper, what is bad about the paper, right? But theory and method is really good, presentation is really bad, right? So, and um, I generally stratify this discussion alongside two dimensions. One of them is the conceptual one, you know, what did they think when they constructed the paper? And then the content, how they actually do it, right? It was the presentation of the paper, meaning how it's written, the flow and so on, actually good. So there's a lot of dy dimensions for analysis that could be um, quite useful. So this is rather short and just seeding again or reco recollecting the kind of motivation because the idea is that uh, afterwards we have an open discussion where everyone should chip in and say, actually uh, suggest, you know, what's good, what's bad, what's ugly about the paper, you know, suggest alternatives or alternative interpretations or challenge the interpretation offered by the presenters, which is perfectly fine. That's what scientific discourse is about, uh, critical thinking. And this will take up the latter part, basically, of that session, right? So that's basically the idea, right? First part, general overview, you provide a lecture de facto on the field. Second one, specific paper. And to see the specific paper is um, you want to have this discussed and approved, and then you post an issue. And the issue has a, um, the issue has a given format where you say, you know, topic uh, on lecture date, of course, is the issue, but also most importantly, you're associated with the label specific paper. And you guys should be subscribed to it. And if you are, then you get notification when the paper comes out. Uh, and then you want to 
uh, read that paper um, carefully. So we recommend you to um, get in touch reasonably early. I mean, latest, it should be decided about uh, before the weekend, of course, so people have a sufficient amount of time to read the paper. We generally try to, you know, include papers that are not too terribly long, right? So um, more like conference style papers, perhaps the occasional journal paper, but you should have enough time to kind of at least get a good overview of the paper in order to contribute to um, the discussion as well. So um, that's uh, really recommended. So um, let me go back to the guidelines. So uh, yeah, here's an instruction of ideally how the syntax would look like. So you have a topic name, you have the date of the lecture, and then a specific paper name uh, as well. And for the specific paper, you want to provide the full reference, but also ideally a link. Perhaps there's a link to a PDF and so on. If not, well, that's fine as well. If it's a DOI, uh, so digital object identifier, it's good enough because we have NTNU uh, VPN. All, all of us should be able to access it via the um, library if it's uh, you know peer reviewed and published in a, a corresponding venues. So, okay, so there are more, some more general hints here on this page about, you know, how to read papers in, in preparation for your report and how to find new papers. We talked about uh, backward and forward referencing as part of the um, um, systematic literature review sessions. Um, consider use of demos, consider use of, you know, perhaps some sort of interactive means, uh, such as Rune does quite a bit in his, in his sessions. You should, you know, try it out as well, see how it goes, you know, to, for example, gauge the background of people. Um, or just a discussion where needed, and uh, and so on. One thing you want to bear in mind: this presentation is not only for the purpose of you know giving uh, sharing information with us, but also getting feedback, because we may give you actually meaningful feedback both on a specific paper or on uh, you know general. Uh, theories or the directions that have been discussed to a lesser extent, for example, in your presentation. And you can use this feedback for your report, right? So you should treat this substantive uh, as substantively important. I always recommend people to bring a note block and, you know, a pen to kind of write literally down what is the feedback, because otherwise you may lose that one. That's actually quite useful. But given that we're recording things, it's probably less problematic nowadays. But in principle, that's uh, definitely um, desirable. And there's, of course, a wide range of um, Different questions that are more guiding, um, uh, or yeah, are more guiding for the critical review of uh, presented papers, right? If you are given a paper, you want to review it or are supposed to review it, um, those are the guiding questions you can apply, right? So, what's the contribution? Are the conclusion justified and actually linked to the analysis? Uh, is the title and abstract sufficiently descriptive and actually provides you know insight about the content of the paper or just buzzwordy, which is sometimes or more more often than not the case in the meantime. There are some links to um, further characteristics and so on. So a lot of different questions to ask here, more specifically centered around serious games, right? What 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 category a game is uh, focused uh, on? How specific it is? What's the target audience? What's the game um, or the actual who pays for the game kind of question, which is an interesting one as well. Uh, is it you know based on ideal ground, idealistic grounds, or is it actually from making money? Anyway, so there's there's a lot of guidance uh, further down here that's specific to the paper review, if you like. But if you look at something that um, focuses on the general um, presentation structure, this is uh, you know one take on it um, that you can probably follow. Feel free to deviate from it, of course, but um, you know it's 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 a bit of a challenge to devise this independently initially. Um, um, so here's a bit of guidance, but uh, again, remember you're not alone in this. So there's a lot of, um, you should have teammates, uh, of course, in the first place, and everyone is kind of in the same boat and not having done this um, before. Any questions on this? Since my group will present next week, yep. we are scheduled. Um, we still have decided on the exact paper we will present. So, mm -hmm. it's like, um, it, it's fine if we send out, like, here's the paper we want to talk about on Friday. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So um, generally, so what you want to do, there's two aspects, right? On the one hand is the overview of the field. That's something you want to have or want to put some uh, energy into quite early already, right? So th this is one aspect. Second one is the specific paper. Yes. So if you were to get in touch sometimes this, you know, mid on this week or something with uh, one or two candidate papers that you would have or even perhaps only one and say, you know, is that something you want to 
we can review and then uh, uh, wait a brief okay afterwards you can post it so i think i mean especially since we're a bit uh, i guess tighter this week if you want i don't know uh, we generally would prefer i think having it somewhat posted on thursday but if it's friday i think we should be fine to read it over the weekend slash the first part of the monday anyway i, I would hope if you guys feel in in, in uh, looking looking forward if you feel that's too tight then we can make this deadline earlier but in the past we have run it like this and it worked quite well uh, we think, though, that people by Friday would know what they need to look um, uh, into over the weekend, yes. All right, I'll have a chat with the rest of the group members on Teams yeah. and we'll come back to you. Cool, that sounds good. So you can do it, you know, by, um, um, you can get in touch with Discord or email or whatever else. Um, that's probably the best way because um, if you do the proposal discussion via issue tracker, then people get confused and may actually start reading papers you put there <laughs> without having this prior approval. So please use the tag uh, specific paper only for the issues you're actually posting the papers you actually then assign, right? So, um, yeah. Other questions? There was a comment, uh, someone asked, okay, hey, uh, oral exam, we need to do this. Uh, and um, I don't like exams. I don't like assessments as well, but we need to do them. So in order to kind of, you know, see what you take away from the course and how you stand. So uh, Rune, I agreed upon uh, the ninth and tenths of here that June 2021. And this is a concession to the fact that, uh, you know, we, we actually didn't find a sufficiently uh, large shared um, slot. We would have preferred to do it in May sometime, but May is a bit of a, uh, yeah, uh, catastrophe in a way, but here's the thing. Um, so it's in June only, but uh, the advantages or what we hope uh, to get from there is that uh, you guys can, of course, critically, since the report, and we can push this deadline a bit uh, if you if you want to, but we want to give you a sufficient gap, and this hasn't happened in the past, sufficient gap between completing the report and reflecting on it, because you want to look with some distance, one or two weeks, at your report again, and kind of see you know what i could have done better this is oftentimes not the case when you just submit the report you know on the deadline and have uh, your oral exam two days later there's no not much reflection happening but if you have a bit of a distance uh, then you can also be more critical about your own work and that's something you want to um, get you guys to do um, as well right so because we do that as researchers as well we build on our own work which implies we're critical about it um, as well so um, that's that's the rationale underlying behind it apart from the fact that there are in fact the scheduling challenges associated with this so that's posted out here now in the oral exam session there was one question in the issue and i hope that's sufficiently addressed at this stage but if you have more comments on this of course please free to post those um, excuse yep. me i have a question Mama, please uh, yeah uh, our group is gonna present on the third of uh, may Yep. which is the last date for the report, for the final report. And uh, I hope we will yeah. have a, uh, enough time for uh, yeah. taking the feedback and uh, yeah. adjusting the report. But can't we just extend the, the, the deadline for the report just like yeah. a day or two after that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's completely a sensible request, Lama. I agree. I mean, especially now in the light of the rather uh, quite a distance. In fact, uh, yeah, that should be a very unproblematic to extend it to that end of that week, for example. I don't think that's a problem. 3rd of May is a Monday, right, isn't it? Um, if I got it right. So we can easily extend it to the end of the week. I'll adjust it accordingly uh, and post an issue on this. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point you're making. Absolutely. I mean, you, you want to absorb feedback and you know put it into your report. So that's a bit tight indeed. I agree. Yes. No problem there. All right. So there's a bit of a discussion going on. Um, perhaps we can discuss our way out on the issue tracker. So you know uh, we, we, we can extend it first and then see if people have conflicting deadlines. Um, but uh, if, if we don't find a way out of this and we see, hey, there's two deadlines on the same day, Again, then uh, Rune comes into power because he would say, you know, one uh, one hour per uh, in, in generally or February is the same as in May. You better plan against it, right? So um, there should be an opportunity to deal with this time management. We are, we are master students, I guess, but we try to alleviate. In fact, we intentionally try to avoid this conflict in the first place. So um, yeah, but sometimes it's just not happening as smoothly as we like. But let's extend it to the end of the week first and then see what the discussion on the issue tracker brings us um, before moving um, further with this okay 
I I think I said everything I wanted to say. Uh, I feel it's important that it's seeded, uh, uh, you know, for for the further um, progression of the course, so everyone is somewhat on the same page. If you have questions, issue tracker, especially if it's more generally of relevance or concerns. Other than that, I would hand over the word to Rune, um, who has to share um, uh, the more important things today. So, but there's there's one. Yep, uh, Sinia, you have a um, comment. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment a bit more on the deadline thing yeah. because um, I have, uh, as I said in the thing, I have three deadlines that week, which is, as you say, <laughs> fine, but um, it becomes a bit funny if I have three deadlines uh, in the beginning of May and then I'll have five weeks of no school until um, the exam <laughs> in serious games. I, I understand um, that. So mm -hmm. that becomes kind of weird, I guess. Yes, that's right. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, we can we can open this discussion also on the issue checker. So we arrive at a date that's good for us. And uh, one thing one would bear in mind that is lesson lesson learned for us as well. We also, by the way, need enough time to read the reports critically. That was has been a bit of a challenge in the past because they're non-trivial, whatever you write. So uh, that's quite a bit of work in there, and you're a large number of people. Some of you will uh, share your effort, of course, but um, um, so we want to plan for that as well. But I I, I completely agree with this, uh, especially in the uh, beginning of. May, there's a lot of deadlines there, so we can de stretch that um, sensibly. I'll uh, talk with Rune about it a bit more and then I'll post a uh, su suggested um, uh, deadline and we go from there. Cool. No more comments, I believe. Anyway, if you have more comments, put them in the chat or issue tracker or at the end of the session. But I think uh, Rune wants to, has something to say. <laughs> Certainly more important than what I do. Okay. I wouldn't be a big surprise with it if I had something to say. <laughs> Well, let's see if we can fit all that into. I, I think we have a uh, pretty uh, good time today. I don't think it's going to be rushed, but you know, uh, depending on the discussions, depending on the type of feedback you, you have as well. Uh, just a little bit of uh, uh, what you say, uh, reminders from uh, last week. Um, let's see. Uh, we talked about theories. What is where? And uh, we talked about the self-determination theory. I will. I did not. <laughs> I had talked about it before. Hopefully, and Christopher mentioned it already today. And the flow theory. Those are kind of important theories in uh, I feel in uh, serious games. And we talked about this zone of proximal development, the, which I think is quite uh, well linked to the flow theory. In the sense that uh, if you if it's too easy, it's boring. If it's too hard, it's too uh, scary. And if you want to learn, it needs to be outside what you already know, but within that uh, proximal development, something you don't know, but still something that's not too far out either. Achievement goal theory says that students may be driven by performance goals, meaning they want to be the best in the class or by mastery goals, meaning that they would like to be an expert in the field. If there are other experts, they don't care, as long as they are an expert. And uh, as we were saying, some students starting having avoidance goals, meaning they don't want to show the bad other things or they don't want to be losers. So, so the, and I think that this is a, um, also uh, somehow linked to self-determination in self-determination theory, you have this uh, competence, um, um, but it's not only, it also has something to do with the, the, uh, what's called self-efficacy. We haven't talked about self-efficacy, Christopher, that could also be something that is uh, relevant to think about. Which means, what do students, um, and attribution theory, attribution theory says, okay, what, um, if you have, um, uh, if you, if you have success, Attribution theory says, okay, is it because you were good or do you explain it because you were lucky? And similarly, if you fail on something, is it because you're generally bad at stuff or is it because you were unlucky in this case? And, and that's also something that's quite linked to the achievement goal theory and some personalities that are personality traits that are, are, are linked here. But then we talked about the more education specific theories, the Bloom's taxonomy, where the, the bottom is remembering and then we go up and being more uh, analytical and applying and uh, the topic of we're able to create something new based on our knowledge. And then the solo taxonomy that looks at the, 
um, uh, knowledge as individuals. You can look at the group of knowledge and you can see how they're related and you can go on and be more complex in your way of comparing issues. And then we had this constructive alignment saying that uh, what you uh, supposed to learn is also what you should use most of the time practicing, which is also what you should be evaluated or assessed on. So they should be aligned. And then we talked about Cobb's learning cycle, uh, experiential learning. You have an experience, you reflect on it, you build up your mental model or understanding, and you can test this model by uh, uh, defining experiments that will give you new experience. So you go in that kind of cycle. Um, and I think that um, although you don't need to know about all these theories, I think the whole way of thinking that these theories uh, kind of encode uh, is quite useful when we when we design and um, uh, introduce these games now so after doing all these theories sorry i should uh, probably here jump out a little bit we did this um, uh, let's see this mentimeter and this is what you found the most surprising. Exams are evil. It's better not to have exams because the students are focusing on passing instead of mastering skills. That's indeed the, uh, an issue. And, and I think that uh, many educators are using exams because we are worried that, uh, among other things, that uh, students get somebody else to do the work. So the, the nice thing about exam is they have it's under, mostly under a controlled environment. We get to see that who's there has uh, has uh, is representing the one that, that should be there. But, but there are there are many reasons, uh, I guess, beyond that. Um, yeah, Sigoski, yeah, he was a real person. Um, um, alignment is important, and I think that this has become an important uh, um, thing in teaching for the last few years, and I think that for serious games, this is also a major concern. We need to think about what are the stu students or players supposed to gain from this game? And how are we sure that the time they spend is on getting there? What activities and are these activities necessary and the right ones for learning? And then in the end, how uh, our scoring mechanisms, if you have scoring, how would that link to the actual uh, expected uh, learning outcome. Um, yeah, all the different ways, taxonomies, so how to accommodate mastery and how we evolve they are. Yeah, but again, think of it this way. What we do is complex. Models are um, trying to, or, or theories are, are tools to try to help us understand this. It's not that it's uh, we need to know or understand all of them, but they look at different perspectives and, and different um, what you say, uh, experiences. We have made systematic experiences on how st the students learn and, and what uh, affects learning. Okay, so that's that's where we were last time. Uh, now let's um, go on. So, what we were wanted to say next is uh, balancing act, and uh, Christopher already talked about the balancing. How 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 important balancing is in games. And, uh, and I think that uh, the new dimensions to that, or some overlapping what Christopher already been saying, is to, to align the instructional design and the game design. Um, and uh, what, what I mean by that is that uh, uh, on one side, it should be learning, but on the other side, it should be game and fun. So, so how, do we, how do we align those? And uh, I don't think, Christopher, did you talk about the uh, player types, the middle types? No, we hadn't gotten there. Depending on uh, progress today, we can do that, but uh, yeah. else you can give them. I mean, uh, as you will know there are different types of players, and I boil them down to two things. One is competitive players versus explorative yeah. players. Some players that really like to play because they can win and they really like to be good at competing, and those who do this because they would like to explore and find new information, new understanding, and uh, information. Yeah. And then we have this individual. Do they like to play individually or in groups? So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, 
now starting with uh, with that uh, activity versus goal alignment and uh, th there is definitely a ma major need there and that is also where i think some of the bigger challenges in serious games are uh, it should teach the students or should help the students learn i guess it's better to say <laughs> yeah, i don't think uh, teaching us but but learn help students learn the intended concepts and not just be fun and engaging now what, what's often said about serious games is that they are kind of neither good serious applications nor good games. So, so I mean, we run into risk of getting the worst from the two, <laughs> to, to the worst in, in, in terms of teaching and the worst in terms of, of gaming. So, so it is going to be challenging to balance. So it's both an engaging and good game, fun to play, and also uh, students learn or what they're supposed to learn. So that means that we need to consider the learning perspective um, and, and the learning experiences. Well, it should be definitely engaging from the perspective of the learner. And even more, it should be successful from the perspective of the instructor. I don't remember if I talked about, uh, did I, Christopher? I, I talk about these things so often. Did I talk about the social science teacher that we talked to, that the, um, Tao and I talked to? Uh, not no, not in that instance. I think we had the brief reference to the uh, chemistry games, but uh... okay. So let me talk. So we we we, we talked to uh, uh, so Tao, uh, one of the master students. She's uh, she wants to do um, a master thesis on serious games for history learning, and um, and trying to not just remember events, not be at the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy, but being more at analytic, being able to evaluate and analyze and see. Trend, trends and, and, and relationships. And um, in doing so, we, uh, I always like the students to, and you know that for integration project, also you have integration project, I like students or all of us to talk to the real users uh, of such, uh, or, or the experts. And in this case, it was um, um, teachers, but we couldn't find any history teacher. We find a social science teacher to talk to here in Eric, and she's using games in her teaching. And now she had, three reasons for using games in her teaching. And she, she, I mean, if you look at the first part there, the games didn't teach the students anything other than giving them an experience. So, so there, this was very much into the experiential view of learning. So, so what the students were doing is that they were playing games like being a mayor. So in the mayor game, be, you win the game if you get reelected after four years. So what you need to do is to balance all the requests and all the push from all types of, of uh, uh, inhibitors in your in your city, and then if you get enough of them sufficiently happy, they will re-elect you. So that's about balancing uh, needs from from uh, for different people. And the other one, uh, one of the other games he was using was the Hunger Game, or not, uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's um, uh, poor. It's what it's called in. Uh, it's an American game, I think, where, where you have a very limited uh, monthly budget and you're going to run a, <laughs> run a family. And the family gets ill, they get laid off, there are things to buy, the dog gets sick, and you have a limited budget. You can't cover all the expenses. You have to prioritize pretty harshly on, on how you spend. So, and her, her reason for using the games is not that the students will learn much from the games as such, but they will have, uh, in her mind, very good discussions afterwards. And she said that the students learned from playing these games, she, she could think, uh, see three main things that the student got from it. Number one, there is this domain vocabulary. So by going through the games, going through the situations, they're starting to have a vocabulary that they would apply to the situation. So the social science vocabulary all of a sudden could be used. Number two, they got to see uh, uh, or they have to have a, a, a reference point. They have got to have some experiences that they could reflect on. So she said that before playing this game, if I were to ask students about poverty and, and poor people, uh, and no one here in my classroom would have any experience on that. So it's hard to get engaged students. But now after playing this game, I could go to each student and say, okay, what did you find the hardest? Uh, what did you do in this case? What did you think in this case? Because they all had this experience that could be used for that reflection, which is actually where learning happened in, in, her, uh, in her class. 
And, uh, and finally, she said, it will help the students to get different points of view. So uh, you could see the uh, being a mayor, not just from that um, uh, uh, the, the uh, one inhabitants type of view. You will have to look at the balance. You would see people coming in with different types of challenges and, and the mayor who had to balance all this. So, so she thought that those three were the most important. Number one, a vocabulary. Number two, um, uh, having an experience to reflect on and then to discuss on. And number three, uh, points of view. So for a game to be successful in my mind, it needs to be also successful from the perspective of the instructor because the instructor has a purpose of, or has an objective and some expected learning outcomes and the game will have to play in that picture. So put another way, game activities should be meaningful learning activities. And one of the challenges in, uh, in serious games, I think is that in many cases, we would like to have very nice and, and, and engaging games with uh, maybe lots of uh, 3D graphics. And, and, uh, and if you do introduce all of that, then also we have to take into account how much time would the student need to, to, to learn the game mechanics, to learn to actually play the game versus being involved in the meaningful activities. So there's, uh, there's some, uh, some uh, issues there. Now, um, there, there are some papers that talks about the misalignments. So one, if you take a, uh, an entertainment game and repurse it as educational game, then uh, much of what you learn is not exactly the goal of the activity. So it may not be bad. I mean, SimCity, Age of Empires, lots of those have been used in social sciences and it may be okay. But, but what typically happens is that those uh, uh, typical entertainment ga games, there's just a part of it that contributes to the uh, learning outcome. And, and you need much more to actually play the game. So, uh, so it could be, um, seemingly a good thing, but then students may play, uh, spend a lot of time on activities that isn't, are not so helpful for the learning, other than learning to play the game. Um, and adding games as a reward system. So if you do well, you can play a game, and uh, or you have some drill and skill games where, where it's really uh, um, it's mostly about the reward. It's, it's not so much about understanding. It's not about much about the, um, the uh, concepts. If you think about the called, I mean, the reflection and actually th reflecting on and building a mental model and, and trying from the mental model, trying to, to foresee what the implications of your mental understanding should be. And, and not just drill and skill and, and be the high score, the one to, to do the uh, as many multiplications per minute as possible. And all those game, games that distract actually from learning, one type of games would be games that are boring. The students don't want to play because it's boring, then it's not so successful. And, and games that, again, in, involve lots of elements that are more distracting to the learning than, than helpful. And you will see several serious games uh, running into one or more of these uh, problems. Now, what about this competition versus exploration? And uh, I think Christopher will, will cover the uh, player type at some time. So in, in general, we are seekers motivated by exploration. Even though we are competitive, we are also to a large degree highly motivated by exploring. And uh, some of us, uh, keep on going up in the mountains to explore new mountaintops. Uh, the, there are, yeah, and, and we also tend to be quite social beings, um, motivated to play and to compete because competition is part of, uh, part of playing. And, and we like to, to uh, I mean, from a, from a nature point of view, from an animal point of view, you would like the, hum the young human beings to be able to survive a real fight by playing and competing in a safe environment first. And uh, whether you explore or compete, I, I think uh, the, there's a bit of relation to the self-determination theory here in that uh, the exploration is to a large degree 
on, on competence and autonomy needs. So, so we, we feel skilled and, and we want to challenge ourselves by using the skills, putting it in play. And, and we do this to a large degree autonomously. We don't have to be told to go there to pick up something and do something. We, we would like to explore ourselves and, and we feel competent to do that. While playing, uh, is very much to the relatedness. I mean, we can play by ourselves, yes, but uh, most of us would find it quite uh, quite motivating to play along with others, even if you don't have to beat them in a competition, but playing along and building something together and, and explore together if that's what we want to do. So, uh, I don't know what, uh, I, oops, it jumped to the top. Uh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong button. <laughs> I would be surprised if you used Kahoot yeah. after how the lecture last week and ended on your little rant. Yeah, yeah no, I, I just uh, pressed on the go to the beginning of the presentation rather than next slide. So I just <laughs> clicked around. Yeah, uh, so the final type of, uh, of balancing uh, act. So I mean, we, um, we looked at the uh, various the, the um, uh, exploration versus competition. And, and the other one is, and, and I, there are more dimensions you can look at, but I, I, I think these ones kind of show some of the additional balancing act you need to in the series games. And this is whether it's individual or a group activity. Uh, it's interesting to see that group in general performs better than individuals. So team-based learning, for instance, in team-based learning, there you have this, um, I don't know if you're familiar with team-based learning, what, what's happening is that you have you read, it's more, most like a flipped classroom, but what's happening is that this space, uh, it's team based when you come to the classroom. So, so you're gonna be reading material, maybe they're watching some videos before you come to class. And when you come there, then you have a, something called the individual assessment test uh, and uh, ask for questions and you answer at your very best. And then you have a team assessment test where you discuss the answers between yourselves before you choose the right answer. And, uh, and it, uh, all those team-based activities show that in general, a group will perform better than the best individual. So, so we know that working together in group has its benefits. Um, but we need to uh, individuals to contribute individual as well. So, so there's one, the uh, learning, teaching, learning methodology called think, pair, share. And the idea there is that each one, each student has to think about something before they pair up and start discussing with the others and they share it in the larger class. And the idea is to find the balance between individual thinking and group discussion. Uh, and this is a recommendation for you when it comes to brainstorming activities put emphasis in the brainstorming activities of a lot of time thinking individually, coming up with ideas, make sure that you record them because in brainstorming, there's a, there's a risk that you may end up with a uh, few ideas, but ideas that you discuss a lot, but what you may want are more ideas and then you need to activate the individuals. So there's always this, how much are you gonna do in a group and how much are you gonna do individually? Uh, team based learning, I already mentioned, nominal group process uh, is what I talked about. Uh, is, is like a brainstorming where you first ask each one to think by themselves and then you discuss in group. And then you go back and think about the outcome of the discussion and you go back in groups. You go back and forth between, between working by yourself and working in a group. So, all of those ways of thinking is to, to say, okay, now. Why do we have to make it either an individual experience or a group-based experience? How can we actually go between individual and, and group-based uh, approaches? And, and that is also a dimension I think could be and should be explored in games. So, I mean, and, and we, I think we all, as, uh, as lecturers, we all use that if we have group activities. In, in group activities, we would like to know what individual has contributed to the group as well, not just the group uh, results, but also the individuals. And thinking about how in a series game or in an activity, uh, you can benefit from having the players sometimes work by themselves and sometimes work with other or, or 
compete or face with others. Now, this is uh, Menti. Let me see uh, what my Menti code is. Uh, yeah, for it, yeah, you can see it uh, here on my, on my, so what I would like to know is in these balances. So we talked about uh, fun versus learning, um, uh, competition versus exploration, and individual versus team play. And I would uh, I'd like to ask for you, uh, the balance there, do you think it's more a serious game for education is more important that it's fun or is more important that it's learning? Or should it be equally balanced? And what about competition? How much uh, we need it or we don't need it? Uh, and uh, individual versus uh, team play, what is more rewarding? It's not that there's an, necessarily a correct balance here, but it's good to see how this, uh, how your views on this uh, differ. Okay, so the answering is nothing up. I think there should be a couple more. I hope you have access to, to a device where you can answer. Um, okay, let's see how the... So quite a split on competition, whether it's needed or not. Some favor yes, some favor not. And uh, there's not so much saying they should be equally balanced uh, or it's partly. So it's, uh, I guess the question type is so that it's uh, probably more uh, towards polarized answers. Fun is more important. Um, there seems to be a little, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of in the middle as well. and the focus towards individual play. Now, what I should say, what, I, what my thinking is that uh, the answer here is not that there's necessarily one correct balance point. There's absolutely no correct balance point. But I think that as um, either as those developing or as those assessing or considering using such um, uh, serious games, I think it's worth trying to understand where, where these balance points are and whether that is productive, whether that is helpful to the uh, general outcome that, that we want to achieve. And what are the challenges and what are the benefits for, for instance, introducing competition? What are the challenges? What are the um, benefits from introducing a lot of team play versus individual play? Interesting. I think we'll have a 15 minutes break. Don't you think so, Christopher? And then we'll look at uh, how to assess. Not serious games, but, but the, uh, what I'm doing is that, I, I, sorry, I think we haven't yet up, up, uploaded that document, uh, but there is, a, there is a research document on looking at learning technologies and how can we assess learning technology. And it seems to say that serious games are kind of special type of learning technology. I think it's an appropriate uh, uh, input into discussion. How are we gonna assess uh, the, uh, a serious game and, and its effects? But let's uh, have a break until 25, 125. Uh, my introduction or my talk about topics related to games for education is to look at how to evaluate games for education. And I think the discussion here can be quite valuable for all use of serious games because we would like to 
we do it for a purpose. And uh, when we introduce uh, a game or introduce any new technology, we should be able to assess or evaluate whether this was a good thing, what the results were. And the, the paper I'm going to talk about is um, a paper here. I'll just show you. Uh, I will upload it. Uh, I have, I was trying to, but I, I wasn't successful in, uh, in, uh, in doing so. No, that was not the one I wanted to share. Sorry, uh, too many screens here. Pro mm. all windows. There I guess. So this is the paper written by Jennifer Lay and Matt Bower. Is how is the use of the technology in education? So it's more general, technology general. I think it uh, should definitely apply to serious games technology as well in education. They did a systematic literature review in 2019. So it's I think it was at the very end of the year. So this is probably a little more than a year old, but I don't think it has changed too much. So let's um, see what these um, guys say. So now there are different themes of aspects. And they, what they do here is they look at the number of uh, papers in these themes and the, uh, and the percentage of papers talking about this. And they, of course, they talk about uh, sub themes, I'm going to co cover that. But if you look at the right-hand side, they talk about established instruments and self-deployed instruments. So um, what are these instruments? Well, these are basically ways of measuring. And, there are some established instruments and the advantage of using established instruments is that we can then compare our, uh, the results we get from, uh, from uh, using the instrument on, on uh, some tool or some uh, game and with others using the same instrument for a similar case. But as you can see, there aren't always so many established instruments. Sometimes there are more self-developed instruments. So. Uh, so that's something to look at when you start looking at getting into a field like this, looking for serious games. So what are the established instruments that can be used to assess the, uh, the, the game that we are looking at? Now, for the, uh, as a major theme, learning, of course, serious games for education is for learning. So, so it's definitely uh, lots of games looking at learning. And then, of course, what are the sub-themes? Some, um, some of these papers, most of them actually look at either the knowledge, achievement, or the performance in a course, measuring how much did the students learn and how badly do they do after the course. And there are some papers on cognitive load, meaning how much mental effort, how much work is required by the students for learning this. And obviously, uh, we need the cognitive load. We want it to be so that students learn, but not too high. And some papers talking about skills development, we know, we know there's knowledge and skills, and there are a lot, a lot fewer papers on skill development than on knowledge. And which is kind of interesting in that games is probably better at certain skills than, than knowledge. So yeah, um, uh, you may need to look into the, the real paper to see why uh, it's more focused on, on knowledge and skills. Um, and then learning styles, learning strategies. What are the students' styles and how that uh, links to the, uh, to, to the game uh, pros and cons. Then we have these effective elements, like um, what are the perceptions uh, that the students will have? And you can see again, that's the most popular or the most used um, uh, sub-theme in the effective element part. Engagement, motivation, enjoyment. Obviously, there are, that's something that uh, is quite frequently uh, measured. Uh, and uh, you can see there's an almost an equal split between established instruments for engagement and enjoyment. No, sorry, 70% uh, versus 30% on self-development. Because on engagement and motivation and enjoyment, there are actually quite a, some, uh, some instruments, some uh, um, ways of measuring. Then you have this attitudes, values, be beliefs, emotional problems, anxiety, boredom, and self-efficacy that we just briefly talked about. And uh, yeah, you can see the, uh, the ratios here. Behavior. 
uh, the, the students use or actually participation in learning activities, the way they interact or collaborate, their self-reflection, self-evaluation, self-regulation. Uh, so, so that's 7% of all the papers go on the more cognitively higher activities or more demanding activities. Design of the game itself, 58 papers, 60% talking about uh, or the designing of the, so the course quality, the course content, course structure, the overall design of the technology and the solution. And then when it comes to the technology, what is the functionality, the perceived usefulness, the perceived ease of use, the actual adoption, people like it, don't like it, and accessibility. The actual teaching or pedagogy, uh, the practice being used, teaching strategies, teaching quality, credibility, feedback, how much uh, of the research is being uh, related to this presence, to what degree uh, students feel the social presence, being part of a community, being present in an environment, and finally, the institutional environment, the uh, capacities or, or um, policies or support. So just a minor, less than a percent uh, on, on the external environment factors. So it gives you kind of a, a, a feeling. I, and what I want to, to get out of this would be two things. Uh, number one is that when we think about introducing serious games, we would like to be able to assess. And then we need to all these dimensions. What what are what makes sense? Uh, and, and sometimes, yeah, we like the students to learn more, but that's an incredibly difficult thing to measure whether they learn more or not. Then you really need a huge study with uh, controlled uh, uh, groups of different types of students, and, and that is in general quite uh, challenging to achieve. So that brings us down to looking at other than just the learning, like the effective elements, like. Uh, the pedagogy, uh, the behavior, uh, and whether they have a feeling of presence in communities. So you may need to break down into, into uh, more than just, we want them to learn as much as possible. And the other thing is the fact that uh, we may want to look for established instruments as much as we can, or contribute and participate in the development of new established instruments and not create our new instruments because that's uh, some of the problems we're having in several areas uh, of research is that each re researcher defined their own instrument for measuring uh, it could be the quality of face recognition uh, audio classification system it could be whatever if there isn't a standard or an established instrument then uh, you could pretty much choose a, a develop an instrument that works very well for you or, or um, but your solution scores highly, but others don't score. And then if you somebody else make their own instrument, they make a different list. So they're going to measure their own their own solutions better than yours. So, so those are two things I think uh, to watch out for and, and try when you go into your area, look for how would the, uh, how would the series games be measured there. And secondly, what are the uh, relevant established instruments? That was the final. And then the question is, are there any final thoughts or comments? You could do it here or you could do it in Mentor if you prefer to be anonymous. But I guess we are a small group and we can take the discussion here about this whole games for education, uh, including the evaluation of serious games for education. I guess what I could ask is, are you confused? Uh, because confusion is good. That's my, my uh, if you're confused on the right things, confusion is good because we can't learn without being confused. I mean, part of that is the, when we want to extend the uh, um, the comfort zone, a little bit confused, good? <laughs> Not enough, but, but work through it. I think there, um, uh, what I'm hoping is, uh, yeah, right. what I'm hoping is that I will help you get see some dimensions, open up your perspective. And, and as this, um, hopefully I achieved what um, something like the, the social science teacher was, uh, was saying, giving you a bit of a, a vocabulary 
for for talking about these things and and secondly uh, 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 different point of, or having some different points of view on the on the problem and that might be quite helpful if there are no questions or other questions thoughts or comments Christopher I leave you the microphone okay sounds good I think it was very insightful to provide a bit of a this, this backdrop. In fact, um, if you listen carefully, you know, this this is kind of little uh, seeds that uh, Rune has given you, where they are pretty much applied all across your topical areas, right? So there's always an element of learning, even though you think about how does fitness relate to learning, right? So because, you know, in as much, I mean, that would be a climbing or a jogging metaphor, if you like, uh, in as much as you have physical development, you always have some sort of mental development. But specifically, a letter paper on technology, of course, guess what? The technology group may <laughs> better want to look at that paper. And in fact, we we may feel inclined to all read that paper, uh, uh, you know, as, 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 as a proxy, because there hasn't been much, uh, you know, um, especially not recently, there hasn't been much uh, of, of that uh, relevance to uh, serious games more generally. Um, uh, from the area of technology because they're all scattered everywhere, right? So some people do VR, then some people do, you know, other kind of uh, tech as relevant uh, and so, or AI or something, but uh, bringing it all together is really good, good move. So thank you very much for this intro. It's, um, yeah. So um, our kind of talks are a bit cross-cutting. What, what uh, I want to do in remaining, uh, what is it, 20 odd minutes or 10 minutes? Oh, that's pitiful. All right, uh, I'll try it nevertheless. What I want to do is to kind of uh, catch up or follow up on Rune's prompt on personality types. Um, because Rune make the distinct uh, differentiation between, you know, like the, the individual versus group work, which is a, an absolute important and central uh, differentiation that we that we have, of course. Um, but uh, I just want to draw um, specifically or looking at the individual side of things uh, uh, more, more, more um, uh, with greater focus, because um, this has been of quite some importance in the context of general game development, not necessarily only on serious games, but to games in general, because, you know, you, we want to assume while group effects are desirable, especially in context of serious games and, of course, work settings, anything that requires the necessary motivation, uh, you know, in the original game, um, a design community was centered around providing an individualized experience, right? So it allows, uh, you know, players of different types to enjoy the same kind of game. Those are, of course, linked, but, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt for you to kind of think about this uh, more broadly. And uh, why this is the case, I'll um, share in a second. So let me just um, uh, share my screen. Um... So that is, an, that is an experiment because I have a bit of a, a challenge there in the sense that I don't have a second screen right now. So I actually need to share a window. Um, let's see how that goes. So, um, or what I, I'll just bring up directly what I want you to see. And you know, let's see, share screen, share my window. There you go. And uh, particularly in the context of game development, there was a bit of a move to um, you know structure the type of gamers that would enjoy a particular game and see how those actually map on particular uh, uh, genres right so that was the original idea right we have those you know um, single player shooting games you like we have economic simulations then but also then we have things like you know farm will I'm not sure if anyone recalls was a big thing for a, a decade or so I think they're, they're closing down now um, and but they're all aiming at slightly different uh, player groups right both with respect to the depth, the intensity that you play, right? If you think like those first person shooters, it's really about um, training uh, skills in particular, right? So like aiming skills and reaction time and things like this. Whereas like, uh, you know, other uh, games such as Candy Crush and so on are more like casual games, right? So that are played in between and are really not any high cognitive load at all, but rather more, uh, uh, you know, superficial kind of pattern uh, detection, usually that, that kind of uh, thing. Um, and others are really more about like just interacting with people and right? not feeling alone. Like, uh, you know, in a pandemic, that's an important objective, particularly for older people who uh, may not want to invest the mental capacity, um, but nevertheless uh, have, you know, social experience that is fun in a wider sense, right? So, and that brings us back to a, a, a topic that has been uh, discussed quite widely in the context of the game design, originally the so-called battle player types, um, which is kind of, uh, kind of an interesting one. They have to be becoming 
to some extent the de facto standard when we think about uh, game design uh, uh, nowadays, but they hadn't been in the past, in fact. Um, they were just a proposed uh, observation that uh, a, a game design studio or um, you know, individuals then made when they actually started to you know, want to, to, to have a systematic kind of approach to game testing and uh, you know, seeing how they can actually characterize individual users. And from those, they uh, arrived at the kind of general uh, structure of the so-called battle types. So you'll come across those again and again. And the main um, characterization is there that um, battle types operate in two distinct dimensions. On the one hand, it's uh, the focus on uh, either having you know agency or structure, that is the players or the world, if you like, right? So that's the one dimension that people are interested in. Are you more interested in about your individual performance uh, and activities and achievements and so on? Or are you more interested in you know uh, uh, learning about the vi wider environment in the wider sense? So we get to that, how that kind of works out in practice. And then there's the other one that's the more active versus more passive perspective, right? So, and both of them, uh, meaning the um, focus on um, player versus the world, can be paired with either of those uh, d directions as well, of course, right? Whether you're more a passive player that observes something happening, right, in a simulation setting, for example, or someone who has ex act actively partake in it and change things, right? So that's one of the other aspects. Um, as well. And um, the uh, quadrants that you see here basically bring this all together and kind of identifying the kind of um, genre that your game, you know, is targeted to. And um, just to highlight some of them, of course, we have the obvious one where we seek on the one hand player centrism, right? So someone is interested in their own uh, activity and of course, very interested in the fact that they actually act in the game, right? So this would be uh, labeled with kind of a stereotypical uh, tag of killer, if you like, right? So the fact that they want to act on other actors, you know, with, with focus on, of course, one individual's uh, performance. Um, but it's generally not in a passive mode, but in a very active, um, um, with a very active interpretation. And then conversely, if you're still interested in the social environment in the widest sense, but you're more interested in interacting, right? So not necessarily passively, but more um, being reactive to uh, other players and their activities, that's what would be considered more like a socializer, right? So where you're more um, interacting with someone else. I mean, again, this would be farm will, for example, whereas I don't think primarily about, you know, uh, beating and, uh, and, and, you know, claiming the world. So uh, I think here, here's, for example, a nice threshold between farm will on the one hand and perhaps a civilization on the other, where you can, civilization is a tricky one. Uh, if anyone has played it, it's basically about um, playing uh, with, you know, I think you pick for a set of select number of, of cultures that you actually develop over time in an economic simulation, but you need to kind of um, uh, share the planet or the environment in the widest sense with other cultures as well. And then you can uh, define and um, put forward your own strategies. Do you want to rule, conquer, or just, you know, coexist in a wider sense? And um, so you're kind of playing alongside the stratum, but it's very easy to play a kind of have a killer attitude as you would have also, have, for example, first-person shooters or a more socialized, you know, um, uh, focus that you know, focus on 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 well-being of everyone in the widest sense. So this would be player centrism. In contrast to this, there's comments. Um, yes, uh, uh, yeah. The there are critiques. Uh, just just to uh, immediately react to Jon Gunnar's comment, he uh, wrote up there there. Again, the thing about the battle types, as I mentioned before, they are not scientifically grounded, right? So they would be forward as the characterization of, you know, th those are the kind of players we know. There are certain challenges with the uh, with the interaction of those ones, but I think the dimensions overall are quite helpful to think about what could be my players like, right? Which brackets do they fall on in the, uh, under? And oftentimes, it's a continuum amongst you know certain of those uh, quadrants, but it's rare that you can kind of cover all of them in a given game. But um, increasingly, we get there as well. We see that in the second hopefully and um, then um, I now look um, primarily on the dimensions that look at the activity of the players more immediately but uh, there may also be an interest that lies more in the interaction with the world right so not so much having a social kind of environment social phenomenon but more like a uh, you know, learning phenomenon that's centered around uh, um, the, the environment that you embedded in and um, on the one hand, it can be acting upon a world again it's somewhat a bit like a conquering activity in the widest sense but uh, not so much with the intent to 
you know, uh, killed your fellow players or <laughs> or at least uh, um, um, outperformed them in any way or another way, but actually to kind of have a certain uh, level of achievements that's associated with this. So if you think about someone, for example, who plays a game for the sake of uh, exploring all its features, and exploiting all these features and kind of, you know, getting to a 100% completion rate, right? Those people that try all the decision branches and all variations and play the game repeatedly just to cover their all possible pathways of the game, those would be achievers, right? So they're not not primarily interested in kind of, you know, necessarily even being the best in the game, but to, to know the game completely. Um, 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 and, and all the possible mechanics underlying it. So it's very characteristic for gamers uh, themselves that actually understand the underlying game design, want to exploit the different pathways. And then conversely, there's the explorer, the one that just, you know, possibly casually, but never let's interact with the environment, uh, you know, just to get to know the world as it's modeled in the game world. So if you think about open world games where you can roam freely, they become increasingly popular, it seems, especially the big ones uh, or the, the games that, that um, exist over a longer time frame where you can just roam around and, you know, uh, explore the environment, interact out of and outside of the actual objective of the game with other players or non-player characters in particular. Uh, or, you know, so, so if you, I don't know, um, GTA is probably a good example for this exploration mode where you can, on the one hand, of course, try to get all the missions, all the special bonus points and so on. But on the other hand, you can just drive around freely and explore the world and interact or not uh, to whatever extent um, you like. Um, so the, the categories are not hard. They're, they're devised as, you know, well-defined and, and hard, uh, uh, um, um, hard uh, with hard boundaries, right? So very discretized, if you like. But in reality, you'll find that both players but also games are more situated on a continuum that allows for one of those two strategies or a mix thereof uh, to kind of keep it uh, interesting and i think nowadays we have more and more games that actually allow pretty much all strategies within a game uh, which hadn't been the case uh, earlier it would be a lot was a lot easier to have a fixed association with the genre and one of those uh, uh, player times more immediately right so this is one perspective so this is the game world. And the question is then also, you know, how do we sensibly link this to um, the real world? And um, of course, in, in reality, we'll find that uh, there has been quite some study on how people actually behave, especially outside of game settings, but more generally as social or individuals. Um, or social members of society or individuals. And probably one of the most f uh, famous personality index um, or a type indicator is the Myers-Briggs one, which builds on an earlier taxonomization by uh, Kai Jung, which was a Swiss um, um, social psychologist, I believe. Um, and they basically uh, identified and allocate individuals along a set of uh, cont you know, dimensions. So each of us, that's the idea, has a um, distinctive set of characteristics that you know, this matrix can um, possibly capture more or less comprehensively. On the one hand, that is being, um, you know, situated somewhere on a continuum between extrovertedness and introvertedness. So I think that's a, a very popular categorization that we all uh, are very familiar with. You know, if someone seeks energy uh, primarily from socializing, from interaction, right? So oftentimes um, there's a claim that teachers have this drive that they need interaction in order to drive motivation and you know, drive a lecture. So they will suffer if you're actually just passively listening. Um, yeah, in a Zoom world. And um, then there's the interesting, uh, the, 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 um, the, the, of course, the converse one, the introvert, that one that seeks energy and motivation from uh, in, uh, being in solitude, actually, right? Being able to reflect independently and then uh, socializing again. That's not necessarily evident based on personality and uh, behavior, but it's the, that's the claim in any case, a fundamental characteristic that an individual has uh, along this continuum, right? So there is, of course, this is not black and white. This is a continuum there. Um, and then um, in addition to this um, stark contrast, there is the uh, focus on sensing with this intuition. Um, so the idea is really like uh, um, uh, su suggesting that people are really um, listening to details um, in the... Um, um, yeah, listening to details when they learn about new facts, things, situations, environments, so it could be kind of a sensing individuals, and uh, the intuitions ones that are um, more, more inclined to see bigger patterns reasonably quickly, uh, and also, you know, m m are willing to forego minor inconsistencies and so on in the characterization. 
in order to arrive at a you know um, pr promising kind of you know s s solving solutions you know getting getting things done effectively as opposed to testing all the implications of you know um, particular theory model or other concerns right so we as scientists we're always torn a bit towards the sensing side we want to kind of think about you know what is the implication the second order implication of whatever we discuss here uh, in a particular let's say theoretical model whereas from an intuitive point of view it could be more like yeah, okay how do we make this work let's not worry about the issues that we have but how do we get this work in the first place and then um, there's another stratum that um, distinguishes between thinking and feeling so which is uh, generally associated with a more uh, uh, rational approach, I guess, or logical approach um, uh, to analysis to particular circumstances, right? So can we draw logical conclusions out of those under consideration of advantages, disadvantages, uh, under consideration of values such as, you know, fairness and, and, and so on? Can we kind of uh, have a more and more... Um, uh, unambiguous metrics for um, any solution that we propose to a given problem or when we want to understand a particular social or physical situation, right? So we embed it. And uh, feelers are actually probably more, uh, if you like, um, um, have a bit of a subjective lens on to um, the assessment of situations, particular with respect to um, being more sensitive to a cooperative and useful outcome. So they may not be as radical suggesting that, you know, logically we should behave the following way as opposed to taking the broader picture into account the people embedded there and say, hey, uh, you know, um, let's come up with a sensible and sensitive solution that may not be, you know, um, co completely based or logically grounded, but that reflect our shared values, for example, and, uh, you know, imply a bit of an empathy uh, perspective um, in, um, in when, when, when interacting with individuals. So it's a kind of a, the, the stratums are overlapping, of course, as well. It's always has been argued that they're not necessarily orthogonal to each other, meaning there is a bit of an overlap, for example, even between think, uh, this, this, this thinking, feeling, and sensing intuition dimensions. Um, but uh, they even propose a fourth one, which is basically something about um, the um, adherence to or the dealing with uncertainty. So when we talk about um, judging with perceiving, the idea is not so much that you know you 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 judging people or um, um, uh, situations more immediately, but uh, the idea is they are based on as to whether you are uh, more prone to kind of um, deal with uncertainty by planning, for example, in an environment. So you plan for uncertainty or against it rather. Uh, and stick to those, right? So very process-oriented um, individuals, which can be good in certain instances, but it makes you slightly less agile, right, for changing circumstances. And that's where the perceivers come into play. They may have initial plans, but they're not cast in stone. They're kind of really, you know, somewhat defined, but loose, um, but uh, generally show openness to changes there, right? So um, allow situational adaptation. So, and with those four dimensions in their respective forms, we can uh, define, you know, um, a kind of continuum or actually a, a matrix of possible personality traits and um the stereotypes that are associated with this and of course we have four dimensions so uh it's quite a bit of a um um you know po solution space that is suddenly emerging out of 16 possible stereotypes um and you know they they, they are then labeled based on those uh, symbolic uh, representations so enfj for example for extrovert um intuit um, feeling and judging. So, and then there's a label associated with this, this that characterizes. I just zoom in a bit so you guys can see what's actually there, written in the subtext, so just to get some intuition, even though it's not terribly very readable. Um, so, um, uh, which kind of you know reflects in an idealized or stereotypical way um, a teacher, right? So that the idea is that you seek uh, energy from the outside, that you work on uh, uh, certain intuitions um, that are relevant, for example, to sense the classroom, um, that you are caring about the classroom. Conversely, by you know uh, respecting all individual values and not necessarily you know um, um, uh, thereby foregoing some sort of uh, logical conclusions, but uh, judging there as well that you have a well-defined plan um, and just thinking about it I probably shouldn't have become 
what I am a teacher because a uh, well-defined plan is not part of my plan. So um, stay, stay in agile may also sometimes be a trait that a teacher should have. But anyway, this is of course an, a kind of really stereotypical uh, characterization, right? But you see how you can see how you can organize yourself in there and see uh, in what stratum you, you sit, for example, right? If you uh, share, for example, the um, focus, let's take another one that is, um, yeah, could also be an option, is um, the ISTP, that is uh, a relatively interesting one. So someone who is rather introvert, so not that, you know, wants to solve and work on problems individually, seeks energy from there, is uh, rather uh, sensing to sensitive to um, the, 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 the environment um, uh, specifically. So, um, you know, when, when making um, decisions or uh, assessing the environment, it's really important to focus on details, right? Detail centrism is a major point there. Thinking, so logical conclusions, classical engineer thinking, I guess, uh, the way that sounds, uh, finding logical uh, solutions, focus on detail and so on. And um, then perceiving, also being, you know, agile in a sense, adjusting to changes in uh, plans quite quickly. So the operator is the label provided here. And if you work your way through, you can kind of see this uh, this dimensionality. There's a lot of um, tests out there, um, MBTI tests they're called, and I think many of you came across them. Doesn't hurt to run them actually. Um, just get a feel where you sit, right? Because they kind of try to put you in one corner, of course. The more recent tests are actually a bit, bit better because they are operate probabilistically. They don't put you distinctively in a corner and say, you know, to, to that percentage you are that type but you also could be that term and so on so it's quite interesting uh, to kind of see where you fit because that says something now we're coming back to kind of team composition uh, it says something of the, about the effectiveness of the team right because uh, if you're all of the same kind of type um, and especially if you share too early as uh, Rune just mentioned in the context of uh, brainstorming then you really kind of have the risk of you know performing groupthink there right as opposed to where when you go you know go uh, for it individually and ideally following the intuitions you know associated with your personality personality type coming back you probably come up with a better set of initial you know uh, ideas before then forming and norming those in the in the subsequent process right so where then you can have a bit more of an alignment process that that integrates those different perspectives and you see where let's say your overlappings exist if you were a promoter and operator which you know for example uh, are largely op uh, overlapping but uh, just uh, defer in the um, source of energy based on their, you know, being working individually or being more socially integrated and so on. So that's the idea. There. So you can think about this, um, of course, as well. But it's also relevant, uh, not only in the individual versus group setting, but also when you think about what is my stereotypical problem group? So if you look, for example, at Games for Health, a very pronounced issue is that you, you know, may uh, address people that are, uh, you know, have some um, uh, perhaps mental health issues in, in the widest sense that you want to address and see which prototype, which stereotype you would associate with them. And when you decide, when you define your game, right? So how do you uh, speak to those concerns or to their personality characteristics and, you know, uh, encourage them to change behavior or to engage with the outside world or to reflect on the same issue from a different perspective, because that's fundamentally what those personality types offer you, right? Looking at the same thing from different perspectives in many respects um, is, is an important aspect um, as well. But it's also good to kind of test your game against personality types, right? Where you you may actually uh, thought you have a very generic game that applies to, uh, you know, different or appeals to different personalities. But in practice, you actually find that, uh, hang on, it's completely overfitted to that club or that crowd here, that cluster, right? We didn't really respect needs uh, or characteristics of others. That may be intentional, but uh, perhaps also unintentional. So uh, it's also important to test this because bear in mind in serious games, we have a bit of a, I would suggest a bit of an elevated responsibility, social responsibility, because we are not looking at entertainment only. You need to bear in mind what happens if someone who is not an intended audience for the game actually plays that game, right? You need to be mindful of unintended consequences that could be possibly disastrous in the particular in the context of health related games, um, or simply have non uh, aligned outcome uh, with what you wanted to intend to achieve, right? When you didn't really respond to the individual uh, learning. The other aspect is there, of course, associated with um, scaffolding. Rune talked about this extensively. <clears throat> uh, you know, how do individuals b learn best? What's the kind of problem you want to expose them to, either by, you know, uh, pitching a scenario or providing a setting? Do you want to have a multiplayer setting where you actually, you know, collaboratively work on, an, on, on a solution? Or do you want to uh, subject players to, like, uh, you know, a set of logical 
principles and they should use those to kind of uh, arrive at a solution for a particular problem good for thinkers i guess um but uh, if if you want to do uh, it intuitively for example for or rather if you want to do this based on uh, awareness issues then you want to set for example and provide a narrative and uh, offer the individual then to come up with a solution to that one so it really depends of course this is really high level and blunder making it up on the spot here but um, it really depends a bit on your discipline and i think um, that is topic area and it depends a bit uh, where which one is uh, most suitable but i would like you to think just about this that there is this dimension that you can reflect on when you um device serious games or analyze them as well bear in mind it may not just be the you know the, the game that you're focusing on your report you're focusing on but perhaps for your analysis you can see what the games typically allude to what kind of personalities they may likely uh, be more linked to um the other model i will not go into detail but i just want to call this out there's of course not only one model right so we, we need to spread this misconception that there's always one let alone right model uh, because they all have their flaws all of them uh, have their flaws there's absolutely no doubt. Um, it's just the idea that a model starts your thinking, at least in, 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 in worst case, if you like. In best case, they have some value, <laughs> predictive value. But in worst case, they're just thought provoking. And uh, an alternative model, which is simpler uh, than the MBTI model, is the uh, big, big five or ocean model that people uh, uh, refer to. And there has some overlaps, for example. It suggests openness to experience, uh, the level of conscientiousness, uh, individuals um, 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 apply uh, for, you know, w whenever faced with a new situation, extroversion, agreeableness, you know, how likely is an individual actually be to, you know, be subject to group thinking, right? So again, that comes back to the brainstorming one, right? So if you have two uh, agreeable individuals, they may forgo their own ideas and just follow the group and then develop those ideas further. So they go deep instead of broad. So, um, so there's this linkage. And of course, the uh, emotional susceptibility to you know, uh, emotional influences left and right as well. So if you send wrong signals using, let's say, your serious game, then they may react um, in an undesirable way or affect it rather in an undesirable way. Anyway, so I don't think we have much more time. I'm well running over time. That's my best skills, as you figured out. Um, so I will just uh, post that slide set. Yes, there are a few more thoughts, but it's actually not, not, not really deep. The idea is really like, what do those models teach us? Um, and they're just providing another dimension um, uh, relevant for player des uh, game design, right? So you want to think about not only how they teach, but for example, how those uh, pedagogical theories or the choices they in, the models that they employ, actually linked or useful or not useful for a particular personality type and for a particular topic area. Right, so you have very diverse uh, topic areas, and you need to think: what are the individuals embedded in there? How do they learn best? You know, and what are the theories employed there? So our intent was to, yeah, Rune said it before, to seed confusion, but also to give you a, you know, think about it like a flower bunch, and you have a lot of different models theories you can now pick and choose from, cross cutting. You know, looking at, uh, we looked at psychological models, motivational models, we looked at uh, pedagogical principles. Now we looked at, you know, different types of individuals, player types think about playtesting and so on and of course the overarching objective of serious games in those um well what is it six weeks or so uh, that we have uh, provided some sessions for right now and now it's bit on you kind of to synthesize this synthesis key point here come back to it uh, and uh, align it of course with the objectives that you have for a particular topic area and pick and choose from there or not if you think they are inherently useless uh, and, and bring those into your talks as well. So feel free to draw on those resources. That's the main point. That's why we're providing it. But you should have a sufficient backdrop now to um, you know, start reflecting indiv independently on those. That's the main um, objective. OK, lots of talking from me in those 20 minutes. Uh, but I hope you got the gist of what it's about. I post the slide, of course, later. But are there any questions before we um, let you enjoy your afternoon? So far, not okay. Um, okay, well, I guess um, yeah. If there are, feel free to post issues. 
Um, Runa and I will have a, a discussion about the deadline extension uh, for, for the written reports in as far as fitting and useful for everyone respecting your concerns. We'll post an issue and then you can you know, uh, comment on this one. Uh, there's still quite some time away, so there's an element of uh, flexibility that we still have. Other than that, I encourage the uh, group of, um, that focuses on awareness um, to you know, really uh, use this week productively, get together and really look for resources. Uh, initially, I mean, Rune gave you a perfect prompt today, brainstorming, right? Do it individual first and then come together towards the mid or end of the week and kind of form something out of this and see that you get structure uh, into this one. And the structure has been provided on the week to some extent. You can follow that one, you can come up with your own one, you can do it inductive, start with example and then end up with a general theory. There are different pathways. There's no right answer to this, to be honest. Uh, but also uh, um, what, something you want to agree on reasonably early is the paper that you think everyone should read because that's the paper if you want to learn about this area or a paper that you actually wanted to see discussed because it's controversial, perhaps even. Uh, we wouldn't shy away from this uh, either. So just ensure that you get in touch, uh, you know, by Thursday, I would say latest, so we can post it by Friday, or ideally earlier if your paper or set of paper and you're somewhat undecided, uh, just get in touch with us. So we give you feedback um, as soon as possible. The earlier, of course, the better. If there are any more questions, of course, email or uh, issue. If there are general questions, I think issue is better. Um, and then we go from there and looking forward to the first, um, you know, lecture by you guys next week. Cool. Well, Susan Tuck, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye. Bye.